that are here today, you look a little more refreshed than usual. I'm expecting big things from you. This first song isn't necessarily a Christmas song, but I'm going to make it a Christmas song. Yeah? yeah? yeah. It's about the light. It's Jesus. You'll see how we make it a Christmas song. Any song can be a Christmas song. All you have to do is add one thing. We'll show you. Here we go. She likes long, dramatic intros. Somebody, good morning.
I tell you what, you people, you people are the hardiest of the hardy. Give yourselves a hand. Listen, and to all you guys that are watching, we wish you were here, we understand, but man, we're glad you guys found a way out of your igloos and made it all the way by dog sled or however you had to get here. We're glad you guys are here. Thanks for coming today. We've got something special today. It's going to be a really, really good day. I've got to listen to these guys rehearse for like the last two hours. It was like the longest rehearsal ever, too. It was, it was but they were great, so you're going to have a good time. L- listen, and I don't mean to embarrass anybody. I, I really don't want to, but we have our little miracles from San Diego back here today. James and Mindy are back. You have prayed a lot for them, and she's been given a, a pretty, pretty good bill of health, and so we rejoice in that. So uh, glad to have and, and you guys drove all the way in from Abernasty today. I mean, good grief. <laughs> Good for you. So anyway, glad you're here. It's going to be a good day. We're about to start worshiping some more. Uh, We're going to continue our series, though, Knots and Knotheads. We're going to look at the family tree of Jesus, and there are a lot of knotheads in there like me or maybe like somebody you know, too. So uh, anyway, we're we're grateful for what God does. Let's stand and uh, continue our worship, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, I thank you that we could gather here on a really cold morning and feel the warmth of your spirit, the warmth of the fellowship of Christ. So, Lord, we lift our faces and our voices to you, thanking you for the opportunity to worship and to celebrate what you are doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Before our Savior, come. 
children weep no more hope is on the horizon weary world behold your promised messiah angels let your song begin
see the amazing works that you've done today. May we not take those for granted today. May we see your hand in our lives. May we see your hand in history. May we see your hand in all the things you've done to pursue us. I just pray over Mike as he speaks. I just pray over our ears that we would hear. Amen. Thank you, man. Man, I love that song. Thanks, you guys. For doing that, it reminds me of something. Just parents, just so you know, I need to make a disclaimer and an apology to you. I just um, went over and spent some time with your children next door, and uh, had the express had the express um, assignment of uh, telling as many bad dad jokes about Christmas as I could tell in a few minutes. So, sorry about you at lunch today. Um, but that song reminds me, Jim, of, of this. Do you know how the alphabet is different at Christmas than the rest of the year? No There's no L. That's right. So, yeah. Yeah, that's the way your kids laughed about the same way. 
It's all right. You're not going to flunk church for that, all right? Man, we're glad you're here. Thank you for coming out. And the, the, Hopefully the roads are better uh, than they were earlier today. We're going to continue this series on knots and knot heads. Today we're going to talk about one of my favorite stories in the Bible. It's the story of Rahab. You may have heard this story and maybe it's new to you, but I want you to hear it with new ears today. This comes from the family tree of Jesus, though. You remember last week we looked at Matthew chapter 1. The family tree of Jesus has a list of people that Jesus descended from, right? And we looked at them and said, man, it's kind of like when we get around one another at Christmas dinner or Thanksgiving lunch and we look around the room at the family reunion and we kind of go, oh, man, you know, this, this is a little strange as far as our family is concerned. We all have that in our family, right? And I, I reminded you that if you looked around the room and you didn't see anybody like that, it probably meant that everybody was looking at you. So um, anyway, but there, there are three or four of them that really kind of come to light in Matthew chapter 1. Last week, we talked about Judah and Tamar. Today, we're going to talk about Rahab, and her husband's name was Solomon, or salmon, if you want to make him fishy, all right? So, sorry, dad joke. And so, but it's an amazing, amazing story as we find it in the New Testament. These are real people that came, uh, that find themselves in the line of Jesus. The story of Rahab in your Bibles comes in the, in the book of Joshua in chapter 2. It comes at, at, toward the end of the exodus of Israel from Egypt into the promised land of Canaan or Palestine as we now call it today. And that story picks up in, in Joshua 2. We're going to read pretty much the whole chapter throughout this message. And, uh, and so just find it in your Bible or your, your smartphone and just follow along with us and you can kind of track us on your notes as well. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men as spies secretly from Shittim saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came into the house of a harlot whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men from the sons of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Now, that's our introduction into the story. Let me give you a little bit of background if you're new to the church or new to the Bible and kind of update you. This comes at the end of a 40-year journey. The nation of Israel, two and a half to three million of them have been out in the desert for 40 years. We're going to talk about the why of that here in just a minute. They were camped just on the east side of the Jordan River across from the city of Jericho at a place called Shittim, which means the place of the acacias. It was a a grove or or kind of a a place that they could go and there was plenty of resources for fuel and, and food and water and that kind of stuff. Joshua, who is now the leader of the Israelites, Moses has died. And he sends out two men to do recon. And they're supposed to cross the Jordan River and go spy out the land. And they're supposed to pay pay particular attention to the cities, to the walls and fortifications around those cities, to their towers, to their military might, and to their willingness, their morale to fight. And they're supposed to bring him back a report so that he can finalize the plan to invade the land of Canaan. At that time in the land of Canaan, and in a lot of places, there weren't these huge nations per se like we know them. Egypt was kind of an anomaly at that point in history. In most places, you had towns surrounded by outlying areas that provided economic support, food, and, and, and uh, skilled workers and those kind of things to make those work. But those towns, especially in Palestine, were really just city-states, much like medieval Europe. And each town and and its immediately outlying area functioned really as a small country. And as they cross the Jordan River, the first town that they're going to meet and the most imposing town they're going to meet is the city of Jericho. And here's why. Jericho was strategic as far as a military operation for sure, but it was also heavily fortified. In fact, the the excavations of the site over the years have told us that the wall of Jericho itself was 30 feet tall. Now, just basically take the, the height of the ceiling in here and double it or triple it, okay? 
That's how tall the wall was. And it wasn't just a single wall. It was kind of a conglomerate. It had an outer wall and an inner wall. And they would move troops around in the space between the two walls. And also on top of the walls, they would build towers or houses. There were people who lived on top of the wall. Rahab is one of those people. We find in verse 15 of chapter 2, Joshua, that she was living. Her place was on top of the wall. And so it's a very imposing place. Now, here's what you need to know about Israel. They have a history of failure. See, 40 years prior, a generation before, they had had the opportunity to go into the land of Canaan, to go in and invade it and take it as God had commanded them and designated that they would. But they freaked out, flipped out, and flaked out. Here's the story. And by the way, I want you to pay attention to this. A lot of times we look at our world and say, nothing like this has ever happened. I want you to pay attention to what happened. This was a propaganda campaign. You control the information. You control the narrative. You control the people. So here's what happened. Moses had sent out spies, scouts, a generation before, 40 years before. And the men who had gone up said, we are not able to go up against this people for they are too strong for us. And so they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out saying, the land through which we have gone and spying out is a land that devours its inhabitants. This land eats people. Guys, I'm just telling you. And all the people whom we saw in the land were men of great size. We also saw the Nephilim. The sons of Anak are a part of the Nephilim. These are giants. Let let me give you one name, all right? Goliath. He was descended from these people. So they are powerful. They are large. They are heavily fortified. They are willing to fight. They're going to defend their land to the death. We cannot take them. Now listen to what what their conclusion is. And we became like grasshoppers in our sight. Compared to them, guys, we're grasshoppers. And you know what? They saw us that way too. And the nation of Israel freaks out, flips out, flakes out, and they don't do it. And so a generation wanders around going nowhere and eventually dies in the desert. Listen, if you don't follow what God has given you to do, you will wonder in your life. You'll wonder for a lifetime until you square with that. And that's what happened. And so Israel has this history of failure. And that generation has died in the desert. Moses has died. The whole generation has died except for two guys, Joshua and Caleb. And Joshua is now the leader. By the way, Joshua and Caleb are the only two guys in the entire nation, two and a half to three million people, who stood up and said, no, 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 we can do this. Follow God. Trust God. You think you're alone at work sometimes or alone in your neighborhood or your family? Two against several million? Pretty good odds if you're going to trust God. And so here we are a generation later. This is the setting for the story of Rahab. So the spies go out and they get into the land and they realize all of a sudden we're being watched. People know we're here. And so they duck into the house of Rahab. Here's how the story goes. And so the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab saying, bring, the men, bring out the men who have come to you who have entered your house. For they have come to search out all the land. And the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it came about when it was time to shut the gate at dark that the men went out. I don't know where they went. Pursue them quickly, perhaps you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them in stalks of flax. We'll talk about what that means here in just a minute. Which she had laid out in order on the roof. So the men pursued them on the road to the Jordan and to its fords. And as soon as those who were pursuing them had gone out, they shut the gates. Now here's the question. Who is Rahab? So let me give you a little background on her. Her name, Rahab, is actually pronounced in the Hebrew, Rakab. And it literally means proud, and there's a secondary meaning that it could mean broad. Maybe she's both. I don't know. (laughs) But that's what the name means. What's more important is her last name. If she had a name tag on, her her last name would be Rahab the harlot. 
The Bible is preoccupied with us understanding what her character at that time was. We know that she kept a lodging or an inn. Now, there's been kind of a movement of late to try to sanitize who she was. In fact, one of the most reliable historians, a guy I use all the time, his name is Flavius Josephus. He's a Jewish historian, very reliable. But he attempted to say, listen, she wasn't a harlot. She was an innkeeper. The name or the word zana in the Hebrew can mean either. And perhaps it's both. I would assume that it probably was both. But when you look at these things, students, here's something you got to know. You got to understand the whole of Scripture. Because the New Testament makes no, it makes no easy assessment of her at all. In fact, in Hebrews 11 and James 2.25, it says, Rahab e porne. That means Rahab the harlot. The word porne is the word we use to get our word pornography. And it only means somebody who is a prostitute or a harlot. So the Bible is very clear about what she was. Now, I think you, you may say, oh man, I, that's a, for sure, that's a knothead in the family tree of, of Jesus. That's a knot in the family tree for sure. Man, not so fast. We all have our own wrinkles. We all have our own failings, don't we? You know, Rahab is mentioned nine times in the Bible. Did you know that in six of those times, she is referred to as the harlot? So let me give you a principle here. The principle is this, that when God reveals Rahab's line of work, when he reveals her character, when he reveals your character or my character to us, God's not trying to diss us. God's trying to bring to our attention this truth that your past doesn't have to determine your future. You may have failed a million times in your past, but it doesn't determine your future. Your choices now determine your future. You may be on a bad road today. You may be in a bad place today. It doesn't have to be the decisive moment if you change your choices. Rahab changed the way she chose, as we're seeing this story. It's an incredible story. See, we need to remember to let God's grace be great. We are so self-focused on our ability being considerable that we a lot of times don't let God's grace be great. We don't let it be so with us, and we certainly don't let it be so with other people. We need to be more graceful. Listen to what the Lord says. Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. What a great day to read this verse. Those of you who walked in this building squinting going, oh my gosh, it's bright out there. Yeah. Though your sins be as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. And though they are red like crimson, they will be white like wool. Let God's grace be great. Rahab also, it says, she had some flax up on her roof. What's that? It was a plant. And they would take the plant and they would cut it and they would dry it on their roofs usually. And then they would take it and they would comb out the fibers of the plant. And they would use the fibers of the the plant in the fashion industry. They would make linen out of them. That's where linen comes from. And so she was in the fashion industry as well as other things. She probably did it for extra money. But the defining character to me of Rahab is this, that she was a Canaanite. More specifically, she was probably Amorite. She came from a tribe of people called the Amorites. Let me tell you a little bit about the Amorites. Over in Genesis 15, God was talking to Abraham. And he was telling Abraham, I'm going to give you this land. This is my land and I'm giving it to you. But it's not going to happen immediately. You got a promise. You ever had God give you a promise? Sometimes that promise happens now, doesn't it? But a lot of times that promise may take you a lifetime to achieve. In Abraham's case, it took more than a lifetime, by the way. It took 650 years. Just figure that. That's older than this part of our our world. 650 years. Here's what God told Abraham. He said, listen, in the fourth generation from you, your descendants are going to come back here. For the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. You know what God's saying there? 
God's saying what the New Testament tells us, that God doesn't want anybody to perish. That God's patience, his patience leads us to repentance, is what the book of Romans says. And God is longing and wanting for these evil, these disobedient Amorite people to come back to him. But he knows they won't because God knows their hearts. And he says to Abraham, in the fourth generation after your family goes to Egypt, they're going to come back here. I'm waiting for the sin of the Amorites to reach its full measure. Just because God doesn't send a bolt of lightning right now doesn't mean it's okay. He's waiting, longing for us to come to our senses, to hear his word and believe it and repent. Now, how detestable were the Amorites? Let me tell you a little bit about their culture. They were blatantly living everything they could apart from the will of God. They would refuse to worship him. They were renowned among the peoples of that region for their cruelty, for their cruelty in battle, for their cruelty in occupation, for their cruelty in the way that they lived. They were incredibly cruel people. They were idolatrous to uh, just a, a tremendous level of idolatry, many gods. They openly practiced religious immorality and they incorporated that into their worship. Sexual perversion became a lifestyle with this culture. Infant sacrifices were very common. In fact, one of the things that they would do is they were building their cities and building their walls and building their towers and building their big public things. They would take a live baby and they would put that live baby in a jar, seal the jar, bury the jar in the wall as an offering to their gods so maybe he would help their structure stand. That happened all the time. Now, guys, here's the point. Rahab wasn't just exposed to this. She was immersed in this. This is her background. This is what she knows to be right and wrong and good and bad. She is presented to us in all of her failure, in all of her struggle, in all of her evil. And yet, out of this life, God does something truly, truly amazing. And here's something to consider. Among the Israelites, she could expect no grace at all from any self-respecting Israelite. If she were somehow to escape the devastation and destruction of Jericho when God brought it on, and she was able to live among the Israelites, the law was that she should be stoned to death because of what she was. She was a condemned woman no matter what she did. I want you to see that. Now, here's what I find ironic, and this is what I love about the Bible. So these guys go spy out the land, and they end up in her house, and they end up eventually making their way back home. Can you imagine these good Hebrew boys coming home to their wives and their mamas and saying, listen, we kind of got in trouble over there, and this Amorite prostitute saved us. Can you imagine the raised eyebrows and the scandalous looks and kind of the sideways glances? I love the fact that God allows those things. You know what it tells me? What God tells some of you guys who think you're so high and mighty and you're better than everybody else, you watch out. Because God's going to take you somewhere that you probably don't want to go to get your attention. He's done it in my life plenty of times. I want him to do it again, all right? I'm trying to pay more attention. But they have to go home and say, man, this Amorite prostitute saved us. Now, the question was, okay, why did they go in there? Several reasons. First of all, it was probably a safe house. In that, they could go in there without a lot of suspicion because lots of wayward travelers turned into her house, apparently. It's also probable that her house, like a a saloon in in the Old West, was a clearinghouse of information. As the travelers that ate there and stayed there, because it was probably something of a bed and breakfast too, if you want to look at it that way, exchanged information. What's the road like? What's the travel like? What's things, you know, how are things here and there? What's the political situation here? Is there unrest? Is there war? Is there struggle? Are there bandits? Whatever. It was a clearinghouse of information so they could assess a little bit more about the area by going into that house. But also, her house provided a way of escape because as we know, as we'll see in this story, they actually go out the window and down the wall. They rappel down the wall and get away. But here's the main thing. In the bottom of this slide, you see it. I don't think it was by chance. 
I think they went into Rahab's house because God led them there. You know why? Because this Amorite prostitute who came from this horrible background had a heart that God knew. And God directed them to her house. Which gives me a second principle to leave you with this morning, and that's this. That random occurrences become regular appointments on the calendar of God's providence. You may think it's circumstance or coincidence. God is directing the whole thing. And he took them there. Not only did he took them there to save their lives, he took them there to save her life because he knew her heart. Here's the point about Rahab. Here's what I haven't told you so far. Rahab's a believer. How do I know that? How can this person who comes from this Amorite background, how can she be a believer? That's impossible. I mean, these people have never heard about God. How does anybody who's never heard about God ever become a believer? Can it happen? We get asked that question all the time, don't we? Here's an example. She could be that person on an island in the South Pacific somewhere. Follow along here. Listen to what she says. For the Lord, your God, he is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. You know what that sounds like to me? That sounds like a believing confession. And she volunteers that to them. Here's what you need to know. Rahab was probably the only believer in Jericho. In fact, as far as we can tell, she is the only person who believed God in Jericho. See, here's the point. Here's how this happens. God had given her a light. Maybe she had heard a story about what what the God of Israel had done across the river. Or maybe she had heard the story from generations ago about the Red Sea. She talks about that, in fact. And she looked out every morning from her place on top of the wall and she saw that Palestinian sunrise. Or at night, she viewed that Palestinian sunset and from the top of her roof, she could look up and see the night sky. And something in all of that led her to this conclusion that there's something out there more than me. There's something out there. There's someone out there that's better than these pretend gods that my people are following. And something in her heart opened to the light of God. God gave her that light and she received it. She embraced that light. She was a keeper of that light. Listen to what Hebrews 11 says about her. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe. In other words, everybody else in her town. When she received the spies with peace, the light God gave her caused her to open her life up to these Israelite recon spies. See, here's the point. Everybody in Jericho had heard the same reports. It was all over the news, y'all. It was all over social media. It was everywhere. They had heard it all. They had the same information. They saw the same sunrise, the same sunset, the same night sky. They saw the same things happening in their world that she did, and they rejected, and she received She believed and embraced the truth, which brings me to a third principle. You see this all the time in the Bible. How does somebody who's never heard of Christ come to belief? Because God gives them enough light and they embrace that light. You know what that tells me? That most people reject the light. God will find you. Don't think that you're too lost. Don't think that you're too far gone. God will find you. If you keep the light God gives you, he will give you more. Let me just give you some examples. In the New Testament, the Magi, the wise men, who were not at Bethlehem, all right? They were not there. They were on the journey. They came as unbelievers who were following this little light that God gave them. And he put a bigger light in the night sky and they chased it. And they find the Savior. Later on in the life of Jesus, when he's presented in Jerusalem, we find Simeon and Anna who were aged people who for decades had longed to find the Savior. And God had told them, someday you're going to get to see them. And every day they got up and said, today's the day. Today's the day. And that went on for 20, 30, 
40, 50, 60 years maybe. And one day they did. God showed them the light and they recognized him for who he was. In the book of Acts, we see the Ethiopian eunuch who's riding back home, reading a scripture he cannot understand. But he's chasing the light and God sends Philip to give him the truth. In Acts chapter 10, we see the Gentile Cornelius who was chasing God, trying to be as good as he could be, not understanding what it took to be saved, and God sends Peter to his door. Later on in the ministry of Paul, we see the woman Lydia on a river shore in Greece. God sends the greatest missionary known to man to have ever been, to have ever lived to her place and gave her the gospel. And it goes on and on and on. That's what happens. When you embrace the light God gives you, he will give you more. So what does that mean to us as the church? You you know why we've lost the narrative in our culture? Because we quit being light givers. We quit sharing the light. We let it be done at church or on the media or social media. Here, we're going to send you this file. And we don't just go share the light. She embraced the light. And God sent people to her door. Three things she believed in your notes. These are important. This is the gospel. This is an illustration of the gospel. First of all, she believed God's promise. What was God's promise? Was what we read God saying to Abraham, I'm going to give you this land. Four generations after your people go to Egypt, they're going to return to this land. I'm going to give it to them. That happened 650 years before. Yet somehow she knew of this promise. So before the men lay down and went to sleep that night, she came to them on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land. How does she know that? Somebody must have told her somewhere down the road. She must have heard a story. And you know what? She believed God. She believed the promise that he would give them this promised land. And she said, and the terror of you has fallen on us so that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. She believed the promise. Secondly, she believed in God's provision. Listen to what she says. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. That was 40 years ago. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites on the other side of the Jordan, Og and and, uh, Sihon on the other side of the Jordan, and whom you utterly destroyed. She believed that even though this nation were like grasshoppers in their own sight, that God could deliver and God would deliver. They believed in his provision. Or she believed in his provision. She believes more than the good Israelites believe. Are you getting this? And the third thing she believes, she believes in God's person. Listen to what she says. When we heard it, our hearts melted, and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord, your God, he is the God of heaven above and on the earth beneath. She believed God was who he was. She believed it maybe more than all the Israelites believed it. This despicable harlot from the people of the Amorites. She got it. And when she got it, man, she latched on. She, she got clawed in, man. And her words spoke her heart. Her heart and her words were perfectly in sync. Listen to what she says. So please, swear to me by the Lord, by this God, that since I have dealt kindly with you, that you will deal kindly with with me and my father's household and give me a pledge of truth and spare my father and my mother and my brothers and my sister with all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. And so here's how the story ends. The spies say to her, our life for yours, if you don't tell this business, don't sell us out in other words. And it shall come about when the Lord gives us this land that we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. And then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall, so that she was living on the wall. And she said to them, go to the hill country, lest the pursuers happen upon you, and hide yourselves there for three days until they return, and then afterwards you may go your way. And the men said to her, we shall be free from this oath to you, which you have made us swear, unless 
When we come to the land, you tie this scarlet cord or this scarlet thread. It was something that was big enough to be very visible. It wasn't a thread, okay? In the window through which you let us down and gather to yourself into the house of your father and your mother and your brothers and all your father's household. And it shall come about that if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood's on his own head. And we shall be free. But if anyone who is with you in the house, his blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on him. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be free of this oath which you have made to us. And she said, according to your words, so be it. And she sent them away and they departed and she put the scarlet cord in the window. It said that the men returned and came down from the hill country and crossed over and came to Joshua and they related to him all that had happened and they said to Joshua, surely the Lord has given all the land into our hands and all the inhabitants of the land moreover have melted away before us. So here's the question. Did God do what he promised? You bet he did because he always does. Fast forward a few chapters over to Joshua 6 as Jericho falls. The people shouted, the, police, the, the priests blew the trumpets, and it came about when the people heard the sound of the trumpet that they shouted with a great shout, and the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight ahead, and they took the city, and they utterly destroyed everything in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey, with the edge of the sword. And Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the harlot's house and bring the woman and all she has out of there as you have sworn to her. So the young men who were the spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brothers and all she had and they also brought out all of her relatives and placed them outside the camp of Israel. And then they burned the city with fire and all that was in it, only the silver and the gold and the articles of bronze and irons they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. However, Rahab the harlot and her father's household and all she had, Joshua spared. Isn't that cool? I want you to think about this, that when the walls fell, the only part of the wall apparently that didn't fall was her house. Because they had to go into her house. It wasn't destroyed. Pretty cool to think about. God did what he said. God responded to the faith of this Amorite prostitute. So what do we learn? What's our takeaway? Takeaway number one. You're never out of the game with God. Ever. You got a wretched past. You're not out of the game. You've got a negative past. Not out of the game. You've got a godless past, not out of the game. An evil past, a shameful past, God takes your shame and in Christ, he makes you shine. Though your sins be as scarlet, they will be white as snow. Be red like crimson, they will be white like wool. A second takeaway is this. Man, if this story is true, and it is, you can trust God. Like Rahab, believe his promise. What is the promise? I will give you eternal life. I promise you eternal life. You can't get it on your own. I'll give it to you. Take him at his word. Believe his provision. What's his provision? Christ on a cross dying for our sins. Christ raising from a grave to give us eternal life. That's the provision. That's the only provision. It's the only provision there ever has been. And believe his person. Believe that he loves you enough not to let you die in your sin, but to provide a way so that you can, can see salvation from your sin. In fact, if you look at the most famous Bible verse of all, it's all here. John 3, 16, say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You know what you see there? You see all three of those elements. The promise, what's the promise? Whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Do you believe the promise? You see the provision. What's the provision? He gave his only begotten son. And you see the person. Who's the person? A God who so loved. Listen, don't let anyone else in your culture steal that narrative. 
embrace that narrative. Rahab, who had every reason not to believe it, got it. Improbable, impossible, unimaginable, but she got it. What'd she get? She got a new life. She got a new future. It says in Joshua 6, 25, that Rahab has lived in the midst of Israel to this day. She hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. She saw her family saved. She got a husband. Check this out. Tradition has it that Solomon was one of the two spies. Man, this is pretty woman even better. Rahab is listed in Hebrews 11 among the hall of fame of faith. She's one of only two women who show up there. Now, ladies, that doesn't mean that women don't have faith. She is exceptional in her faith, though. That's why God put her there. She's not in the hall of shame somewhere. She's in the hall of fame. And people read about her to this day. And she is proudly presented in the lineage of Christ. What does she tell us? Faith works, man. When you have faith in God, it makes you do transformed things. It's what the writer of, of James said. He said, in the same way, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works? That doesn't mean that she earned her salvation. Because we saw in her testimony what her heart was. But her heart made her do some things, receive these spies, protect them, preserve them, help them escape, and to trust what God had told them to do and bring everybody into her house and not let anybody out when the destruction came. Can you imagine what that day would have been like for that family? Oh my gosh, that would have been terribly traumatic. As the walls fall and you're sitting there thinking, okay, we're about to go down and you never do. And you hear the battles and the cries and the bloodletting outside and you're wondering, okay, are we next? And you're not. Because you trusted that God will preserve you. And he did. She had faith and it led her to act differently. What about you today? I think it's a fair question. Have you believed the promise of God? Have you believed, do you believe the provision of God? What about, do you believe the person of God? Maybe today's the day, if you've never done this, that you turn your heart to him. And you ask him to save you the way that Rahab asked them, save me. You just look at God and say, listen, we know that we can't survive on our own. I'm a sinner. I can't survive on my own. But Christ has given me salvation by his work on the cross, if I will trust that. The provision is sufficient. It's enough. The promise is that I will have eternal life. Maybe that's something you need to do this morning as we pray. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you for this incredible story of this amazing woman who had no reason culturally, historically to believe. And yet, Lord, she embraced the light. You gave her a glimmer and she latched onto it. And she held onto it all the way to salvation. Lord, thank you for that promise that you will find us. And Father, maybe there's somebody in this room or somebody watching online today, because I know so many are, who's never trusted you, who's never come to you and said, okay, I'm not doing this on my own. I trust you alone. I believe the provision of Jesus on the cross was enough. I believe the resurrection can give me life, so I embrace that and believe that. Lord, thank you for your salvation. Thank you for this incredible story of this Hall of Fame woman who gave her life to you in an improbable place at an impossible time. And she received an immeasurable salvation. In the name of Jesus who gave it to her and to us, we thank you. Amen. This morning as we receive our offering, I uh, just want to point out a couple of things to you. Uh, look on your... Um, your just a notes here, if you, if you don't mind. Uh, a couple of things. You may have noticed in the hallway, if you came in this door here, one of our banners out in the hall is talking about the THF connection that's starting here in just a few weeks, uh, first part of January. If you want to be a part of that, take that connection card that's in your packet of material, fill it out, give it to one of these guys, drop it in an offering box, and we'll, we'll go ahead and, and get that going as well. Uh, students, notice that you got Disciple Now coming up uh, pretty quick. But then uh, notice this. 
We have a couple of things coming up in just a couple of weeks because Christmas is upon us, guys. We're going to have a Christmas Eve service on Monday, but we're also going to have Sunday services on Sunday. If you want to be a part of the choir, right there is Jim Archer. You can see him. You can put it on your connection card, and we'll get in touch with you or whatever we need to do for that. Two of the next three weeks, we're going to be in a single service. Know that. Next week will be normal. Two services, regular times. The week of Christmas, the 23rd, we're going to have one service at 9.30, all right? And the week of New Year's, we're going to have another single service at 9.30. Our people travel a lot, and so we figured out that's a pretty good way for us to kind of handle the holidays when they're this close to the weekend. So anyway, make notes of those. Invite people. Man, we want you to be sharing the light out there in your community. Can you do that? All right, go out there. Hey, guys, drive safely. Be very, very careful. Get plenty of time and a lot of room, all right? Let me pray over you before you go. Heavenly Father, we pray for safety. Lord, as we gather up our families and our friends and we go to the next thing, whether it's to eat or the next meeting or appointment we have to go to today, Lord, we pray for safety. Lord, I pray you protect these guys, you protect their property, you protect their lives. Lord, be with them as they go and help them to be light bearers. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys. See you.